thank you all who um, is actually here. Um, as you all know, I am Morello Kane, you know, and so we have a beauty brand, but our brand is focused on hair loss solutions, and that is via services, media, and creative innovation. And so, but now, I am not here to talk about the hair debate. I am here on behalf of Morello Kane, um, that's for the community in building empowerment. And so I have with me, joining me, these beautiful women behind me, and I have to thank you guys so much. You know, um, they definitely saw the vision that I had and locked arms with me, and I greatly appreciate that. And so I have with me Ms. Um, Ayana. Did I get it right, girl? <laughs> I have Ayana, um, she is going to speak to us on beauty, and her experience that she's gonna share is what it looks like when we work behind the chair. You know, and so also too, that birth, this brand that she has here that's geared for women and is about body health. So definitely if you have not checked it out, you must, must check out her complete line um, for women. It's absolutely gen genius. And then also, too, we have with us Miss Crystal Jordan, um, Enchanted PR, has sat on many stages in many platforms. And so when it comes to, she's going to speak on mental health. Um, and then effective communication. Um, this is her expertise. Okay, her expertise is also business as well. And so she, she wants, a, a, I, I mean, I tell you, a bad line in it. I absolutely love everything that you're doing. And then this baby that we have with us right here, Miss Lauren Dior, <laughs> a media influencer she is, and she is gonna share with us um, her experience in addiction. And so, you know, I want you guys in your gift bags, your boxes, um, is a pen, a pad, you know, um, you know, your young people, I would love for you guys to take notes they're gonna absolutely give out some great information that's gonna be beneficial for you, relationships with your parents, you know, and so I, I definitely want you to be able to take away from this. So now, but before I bring them um, to the floor to share, we have with us an up and coming artist, China Key Air, and she has her song of choice that she's gonna give to us and bless us with today. Come on, love. Now show up with it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. She was lost in so many different ways Out in the darkness with no guide I know the cost of a losing hand Never thought the grace of God go high I found heaven on earth you are my last, my first. And then I hear this voice inside. Ave Maria. I've been alone when I'm surrounded by friends. How could the silence be so loud? But I still go home knowing that I've got you. There's only us when the lights go down. 
You are my heaven on earth. You are my hunger, my thirst. And then I hear this voice inside. Ave Maria. Sometimes love can come and pass you by While you're busy making plans Suddenly hit you and then you realize It's out of your hand Oh, you've got to understand You are your heaven on earth you are your last, your first, and then you hear this voice inside. Ave Maria. I wish I could sing it like that. But <laughs> and so I am going to bring down Miss Lauren Dior, and she's going to share with us. Um, we're gonna have a conversation about addiction. You know, um, she's gonna talk to the kids regarding what addiction, peer pressure, looks like today, and to you parents on some signs of it. But then she's gonna also too share her story that you are truly going to be moved by. Thank you, Lauren. Hey, y'all. So, I am the Lauren Dior, but my name is Lauren Marshall. I was born June 25th, 2003, so I'm 20. Um, so I'm gonna be so honest with you guys. I had two months to prepare to do this, <laughs> but I, relapsed I was almost three almost uh, just about three months clean and I relapsed and I was like you know I gotta I gotta check myself in somewhere because I can't get up here and talk about sobriety and stuff knowing that I'm using because I just that's messed up so um I was in re I just got out of rehab two days ago uh, <laughs> and I was there for 30 days and um I feel like the place that I went to, it definitely changed my life. I feel like it saved my life. And um, it's scary because it's so many, like, people my age, like, 20 and younger, that's, like, dealing with addiction, whether if it's with alcohol and they think it's cool because I'm like, okay, let's go out. Let's, let's get drunk. And it's like, okay, you got to have a bottle every time you go out. I'm, I'm scared. And then, you know, with other stuff like weed but now there's stuff out there like fentanyl and it's so easy to get addicted it's a whole opiate crisis going on right now and it's just it's scary right now and I just want to go ahead and share my story so I'll know a little bit about me and then I'm going to talk about a little bit of peer pressure for my girls because peer pressure does not look how it did back in the day like how it does now it's you don't you wouldn't even notice that it's peer pressure so um, I was born in Conyers, Georgia, in Rockdale County, and we've moved <laughs> everywhere. So um, now I live in Gwinnett. Well, I was living with my mom in Gwinnett, Swanee, Georgia, but after I got out of rehab, I went to a sober living because 30 days I'm not just cured from something I've been dealing with for a long time. It just, if only it worked like that. 
But so to keep that stability and that same structure that I had in rehab, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go to sober living. Fun fact, I got kicked out of this sober living, but I'm like, nope, I'm not going to do that again. We're going to we're going to get it right this time. And I'm, it is serious. Like after I get up out of there, I want to go be a tech at a rehab so I can help people and stuff. So I feel like I found my purpose now. Um, back to my little story. Um, yeah. So I have ADHD. So I've been um, taking pills forever. Not that it was like anything wrong with it. Like I had really, really bad ADHD. Like I could barely learn. So I was taking Concerta and stuff and um, I hated it. Like I didn't want to take them, <laughs> but I needed to because I couldn't focus at all. But I would always like throw them under the couch and stuff. And I remember one time my mom like was cleaning and she pulled the couch out and it had to be like three bottles worth <laughs> of pills back there. And she was like, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know. But, um, so that was already just already in my nature. Like, you know, it wasn't, I know other kids who didn't like, you know, taking medication. I didn't mind it. But, um, as I got older, I was getting bullied in school a lot. Um, I never really could get the whole friends thing. Like, I and even with my siblings, like, it was just always kind of weird. And my dad has 13 kids. So um, I have six sisters and six brothers. And um, my, it was never really bad with my brothers. I've always been pretty good with my brothers. But my sisters, it's always been kind of weird. So I feel like that kind of stemmed, like, I didn't really know how to have friends. I didn't, and not that I was a bad friend, but I picked the wrong friends because I didn't know what a friend is supposed to look like. So, um, and that just messed with my head for a long time because I just, I, wa I just wanted to be accepted. Like I've always wanted to be accepted. I've always wanted to be liked. I've always wanted people to think I'm cool and all that stuff. So. Um, yeah, like when I was in middle school and elementary school, I had spaced out teeth. I got bra—I had braces for four years, but um, I put tooth gems on my teeth this morning, and I regret it because I did it wrong. <laughs> They're too big, but I'm like, you know what? Just got to see it through. So um, off topic. <laughs> but yeah, so I used to get made fun of so much for my teeth and my hair. I went to a predominantly white school growing up, so I would get picked on by my lips and my hair and literally everything like my shoes anything they could pick on they picked it like a scab so um I just that was just always it already I wanted to be accepted and I wasn't I just kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back so you know it was kind of making me very self-conscious very angry at myself like what am I doing wrong what what do I need to fix so people will like me and um that just went on for a long time. Um, when I was in sixth or seventh grade, um, I had tried to commit suicide, and um, because just the girls and guys too were very mean to me at school, and I didn't know what that I was doing though. I'm not gonna lie, like I, I'm not gonna get too much into detail, but trigger warning, um, I had slit my wrist. And I didn't know it was going to be that bad. And I remember my cousin Paris was staying with me at the time. And I was in the bathroom. And it was blood everywhere. And I was like, <gasps> and I like had my arm wrapped with a paper towel. And my cousin walks in the bathroom. And she was like, I was like, please don't tell my mom. And she's like, I miss it. And she runs downstairs. And it was just like a whole big thing. So that was, that was just that kind of set the tone, like, as far as like where my mental health was when I was younger. But I didn't realize. I just knew I was very sad. And I didn't like me because no one else liked me. So I stopped liking me. And as I got older, I tried to and stuff, and it was just weird. But when I got to eighth grade, that's when I found out I was pretty. Um, Cause I didn't know I was pretty. And we moved to Gwinnett at the time. So it was 2016 and the guys were, the boys in my school, I won't say guys, it was boys. They were saying stuff like, oh, your butt's big and you're cute and you're pretty and da 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 da. And they all had girlfriends though. so. Their girlfriends hear them saying this stuff about me, so now they got a problem with me. I just got there. I don't even know nobody. I'm trying to get on the cheer team. I'm trying to do something. So um, it was just, it just sucked. 
it sucked really bad because I'm like, dang, I just got here and they already don't like me. Like, what did I do? And um, I remember I was with this girl and um, she smoked weed and I was hanging out with her and stuff. She didn't go to my school. She went to a different school, but I don't even know where I met her. But um, so I would go to her house and stuff and they smoked weed. And she would always, every time I would go over there, she'd be like, want to hit the blunt? And I'm like, no, I don't want my mom to find out. I don't want to go home smelling like weed. I don't. So I just, I've always had really bad anxiety. So I was just, no, no, no. But it was one night, my mom was like, yeah, you can spend the night. And just ahead of this, I don't blame my mom for any of this. I feel like I was conscious of all my decisions. So just want to let y'all know that. But um, so I go to her house and... I, I, I knew I was spending the night. I had my little backpack ready and all that good stuff. And she was she asked me again. She was like, do you want to hit the blunt? And I was like, okay. My mom's not going to – I'm not going to be high tomorrow, right? Like, I'm only going to be high tonight, right? And she was like, yeah, like, when you go to sleep, it'll be gone. So I was like, okay. So I hit the blunt. I swear I was one with the couch. Me and the couch were the same person at that moment. I just – and I knew right then and there – I was able to change how I felt. I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel insecure. I didn't feel, I felt like I was on top of the world. So I just remember next morning, I was like, can we smoke? Can we smoke? Like I was, it was bad. And she was like, you need to chill. And from that and on, like I always smoke weed and my mom didn't like it. My dad did not like that. Like I was raised as a Jehovah's witness. So it just, it kind of caused a little bit of problems because I was trying to sneak and, I used to go through some things just to hit the blunt about three times. Then I get caught and get it confiscated every time and get it thrown away. And I just keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And then I got to ninth grade and I remember being bored one day and I was going through medicine cabinet because I knew Benadryl makes you sleepy. So I'm like, okay, what else makes me sleepy? Cause I like that sleepy feeling. Because when I'm high, I feel sleepy. So I'm just over here connecting all the dots, trying to see what I can get. And um, I remember I found, I don't even know, it was like a low dosage Xanax or something. And I remember I took it right before I went to school. And I felt like I was floating. I felt like I was invincible. And I was in class looking stupid over there like this. And my teacher's like, are you okay? And my friend was taking notes from me because I couldn't stay awake. And I just remember, it wasn't, I think it was only like two left in the bottle. So I was like, okay, I can't take another one because my mom's going to know I was in here. So that was that. And um, as I got, you know, in ninth grade, I always was smoking weed. I was always high, but I was also still getting bullied. So I was like, okay, I know when I'm high, I don't feel this hurt that people are making me feel. And side note, I'm backtrack real, a little bit. When I was in eighth grade, I remember getting high that weekend and coming to school on Monday. I had two friends, but they were barely my friends, but I had two. And I came to school, I was like, y'all, I smoked weed. They're like, what? You did what? And I was like, oh. I thought I was going to get a way different response. So then I was like, oh, my gosh, okay. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, and I wasn't kidding. So, yeah, back to ninth grade. So it was just I was on the cheer team. It was cool. Um, I think I had, like, one or two friends. Um and I just remember, like, I barely remember ninth grade because I was just, I just wanted to be high. And I ended up switching schools, and I was at North Gwinnett High School, and then I ended up going to Lanier High School. And um, I liked this boy who was on the basketball team, and he was, like, popular. Like, all the girls were cool with him, all the guys were cool with him, and he liked me. And I'm like, okay, cool, we're going to the same school now, like, it's lit. And I'm thinking it's going to be cool because everybody like him. So if I'm his girl, everybody going to like me. Eh, wrong. No. I get up in there and they're like, oh, so you you with Robert? And, da, 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 da. and I'm like, yes. Like, I was scared. I didn't I didn't know what was going on. I didn't, I didn't know what I was walking into because I guess he was already telling people about me before I even got up in there. So um, it just sucked. And I just was like, you know what? I'm going to do what I did last year. I'm going to come to school high because I don't have to deal with no, I'm not going to care how you think about me. Like, I'm good. Put my headphones in. I'm in a whole nother world. 
So, and I kind of made a little name for myself. Like, everybody knew Warren's going to come to school probably a little bit late, high, and smelling like gas, and music blasting. And I was a class clown. I was always playing around and stuff because, once again, I just wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be liked. And I knew that I'm funny. I can make people laugh. And even if they don't want to be my friend, they can still be like, that girl's funny. That girl's this. Not something bad. So, um, yeah. 10th grade was cool. I ended up getting kicked out <laughs> of, tenth, of that school because I was already on a permissive transfer, which is when you get permission to go to a school out of district. And um, I was I had referrals on referrals on referrals. Like, I was bad. I always... I've never been good with authority. So the teacher would be like, Lauren, you need to stop talking. I'm like, everybody else talking, though. Why are you picking on me? And then she's like, I'm not picking on you. I'm like, you are. Like, I, I was, if you gave me a little bit of, if you gave me an inch, I'm taking a round trip, not a mile. So I was always arguing with my teachers. Um, and so I already had referrals. So when I got in trouble, it was because they found weed in my bag, which I didn't know I had. But then my friend was like, hey, let's go smoke it in the garden. And I was like, that's a terrible idea. Let's do it. So we go and we do it. And I just remember hearing, like, keys. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm about to get in trouble. Like, I'm having a panic attack. And I had an idea. I was like, okay, I got to pee. So took my pants off, squat on the ground, started peeing. And as the assistant principal's coming up, I'm like, no, go away. I'm peeing. Go away. So he actually turns around and goes like this. So I'm saying to the girl who's with me, I'm like, throw it, get rid of it. And she's like, huh? And I'm like, throw it. And then the guy was like, you can't be still peeing. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm done. So he comes up, the whole little weed setup is right there in the middle. And he's like, yeah, you're getting kicked out. You're, you're done. You're not being at this school anymore. Like he literally said that to me. And I was like, wow, the nerve. So I got kicked up out of there. Then I went to alternative school, um, with the bad kid school. And, um, that was a breeze. Like, uh, it's the easiest schoolwork in the world, honestly. So finished that. Then 11th grade, I went to another school because I couldn't go back there, and I didn't want to go to the school that I was district for because they was rude mm -hmm. to me there. So I'm at this school, and then it's called Meadow Creek, and I didn't understand why people were calling it Ghetto Creek, but I knew that I had some friends there. I want to go be with my friends. So I went there, and <laughs> I will never forget the bathrooms were a magical place if you like to get high. So I go into the bathroom. I remember I was there. I got my school stuff all together. I'm like, this this place ain't that bad. They had the best. They had like a food truck, Chick-fil-A. Wow. A, 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 I can't remember. Like the culinary classes, they cook for lunch. So they had all these different options. I'm like, I'm living. Uh, this is nice. I remember going in the bathroom when I was in math class. And I failed my ninth grade math class because... I was always high in ninth grade, so. So Lauren. Yes, ma'am. Is that when everything escalated was at that point? Mm hmm it was 11th grade. And I just remember I had had my first perk in 11th grade. I had my first Xanax in 11th grade. That's when I started dabbling in that stuff. And I just, someone was offered me a perk and I liked perks. So I was like, I'm gonna keep taking perks. And it wasn't until I wanna say maybe last year Someone offered me a Perk 30. Now, they discontinued Perk 30s about four years ago. What you see now that's a Perk 30 is press fentanyl. It's not a Perk. Perks, it's, it's not that. And it was, like, it was socially acceptable when it first came out because there was a song it's like, Perk 30, I just bought a Perk 30, all that. So people think it's cool. And then there was posts going up like, don't take those. It's fentanyl in them. And, da -da -da. and overdoses started happening and all this, that, and the third. But by the time I found out what was in it, it was too late. Like, I'm asking the plugs, I'm like, hey, can you serve me? They're like, you know these are fake. I'm like, are you coming or not? Do you want my money or not? I didn't care about that. So um, I didn't know that I was addicted until I withdrawed for the first time in my life, and it was it was scary. Like, my body was hurting. I, could, I felt like I couldn't breathe. Like, if any of you have ever watched Euphoria, and if you've seen the scene with Rue withdrawing, it's exactly like that. So um, it was just really scary, and that's when my mom found out because I stumbled down the stairs, and I was like, Ma, I got to tell you something. And she's like, what? I'm like, I'm withdrawing. She's like, from what? And I'm like, perks. And she's like, what? So, she, you know, she helped me get back to 
health and stuff, but I ended up being sneaky and I had the plug pull up on me and g- gave me perks. And she's like, how are you like, okay? And I'm like, mm, I'm fine though. So my mom's not stupid. So she's like, mm. so basically it just, it just kept going down. Like it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Like, and I tried multiple things, shrooms, LSD, hydros, oxys, all that. I had already tried that. But when I tried this, I was like, I like this. I want this. I don't want that stuff. So it was just, it was a scary time because everyone around me is taking a perk. You want a perk? One perk? Perk set? And I'm like, so, yeah. So yeah. now, so now, at what point did you, was that the, the point that you say, okay, I now need to get help? Um, I had, my mom had found my stuff and she flushed it down the toilet and told me. And I had a really bad episode, like, and that's the thing about addiction. You're not yourself anymore. You turn into a completely different person. You don't care about the same interests you had. Like, mm-hmm. all you care about is that. And your brain is telling you, I want more and more and more and more and more. And there is people in this world who could possibly pick up a drug, take it, and put it down, and never do it again. But unfortunately, I suffer from the disease of addiction, where I can't pick something up and put it down. Like, I just can't. So when I found out that that happened, I, like, tore up her room, messed up everything. I broke a lamp that's been around longer than I've been alive. Like, it was just a whole bunch of stuff. And after I smoked a little blunt and I looked around me and I was like, oh, my God, I have a problem. So I asked my mom, I was like, can we look for rehabs and stuff? And she was like, yeah. And I went to a rehab and I ended up leaving early because things weren't going my way, and I'm a brat. I went to a sober living, got mm-hmm. messed, I, I got totally focused in a boy more than my own sobriety. So now, let me ask you this. So can you share with the, with the, um, the students that are here and what peer pressure looks like today? Mm-hmm. So peer pressure, honestly, it, it can be something as simple as just Hey girl, um, do you want to go get drunk tonight? And you could be like, ah, I don't really feel like it. And they'd be like, Girl, you lame. Come on, you always in the house. Come on, just just come outside, pop out, stuff like that. It's it's not like back in the day. I know it used to be like, Come on, just do it, just do it. Come on, come on, come on, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Like it was very repetitive. But now I feel like it's just like someone could post a poll on Instagram and it's like what's the move tonight or something and you might not swipe up and they can DM you and be like, you never pop out, like, what's up, let's do something. And you're like, nah, I don't really feel like it. And they're like, come on, like, let, let's just have fun. It's just one night and this, something like that. And um, it's sad because we don't really notice it. We just look at it like, okay, we're just having fun. And sometimes it really is just that simple as having fun, but you don't even notice it. And peer pressure can also be played off as like you seeing everyone else doing something and because you don't do that, they acting weird towards you. That is peer pressure because you're going to feel like, well, what's wrong with me? It can either be taken as like, okay, I don't care. Or, okay, well, let me just try it because everybody else doing it. Like, it's very enabled now. Like, you don't notice it because everyone else is doing these things. So um, I think if you keep an eye on those type of things, like, just try to be aware because it's just going to get worse and worse and more less noticeable as we as time goes on but um and another thing for the moms in here if anyone you know as kids or whatever it's as an addict I knew how to hide my addiction recovering addict excuse me but I knew how to hide my addiction especially because I knew my mom knows me like the back of her hand so I'm guessing that y'all know y'all kids like the back of your hand So it was real easy for me to hide it until it wasn't. And I feel like the things you should notice, if your child is pretty open with you and they start randomly getting closed in, they're doing something they don't got no business doing. I'm sorry to my girlies in here if I'm giving up the tea. I'm so sorry, but I'm trying to save y'all lives up up here. (laughs) But, um, yeah, like, it starts off with, you know, the distance, random, like, resentment kind of like you knock on their door oh mom leave me alone why you keep coming to my room stuff like that like me personally I can't speak for everyone else on how it would look on everyone else but me personally I feel like it was 
noticeable when I just never came out my room anymore. I was always in my room. And the type of person I am, I got ADHD. I have to move. I can't sit in the same spot and do the same thing all day long. I need to run down the stairs. I need to walk around, open the fridge four times, like something else is going to pop up in there, like just doing stuff like that. And um, I stopped, stopped eating as much as I did. And my mama can cook. She cooks a full course meal every night. And I stopped eating. Um, I didn't really s go out with my friends as much as I did. I stopped keeping up with my appearance. Like, my nails was never done. My lashes was busted, hair busted, lace lifted. It was just terrible. So it's just little things like that. But it, once again, it's different for everybody. Um, but if you have, and this is for everyone in here, if you have any family members who deal with alcoholism, deal with addiction, or whatever, there is something for y'all to go to, too, because, um, you know, you know people who have deal with addiction, they go to AA, like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. There's stuff for people who have family members who have to deal with people, like re relatives that deal with addiction, and it's called Al-Anon, and that's for people Say if I have a family member who's an alcoholic, I can go to Al-Anon because it's not easy being related to somebody or care, having a friend, somebody you care about that's living a life like that because you're watching them destroy themselves. You're literally watching them kill themselves. So, and it's hard and you don't even, therapists might not even know what to tell you. So you can go somewhere where there's people who's dealing with the same exact thing you're dealing with and y'all can talk about it and figure out you know, how to deal with it. And then there's Nar-Anon, which I think sounds so weird, but it's Narcotics Anonymous Non, whatever that means. And it's just the same thing as Al-Anon, but for if you have a relative or a loved one or somebody you care about that is addicted to drugs. Because um, like I said, it's not easy l caring about somebody who does not care about themselves because they're literally destroying themselves by choice. Not by choice, but by choice. Because we can't really stop. If we wanted to stop, there'd be no addicts. But um, it's very hard, but it's definitely possible to get through. I'm 32 days sober today. I Wish I could have said four months, but. <laughs> so if you ever have anybody dealing with this, um, it's not always easy to go straight to them and be like, I know you're doing this or this, that, and the third. But the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Half the time someone's dealing with alcoholism or addiction, it is because there is a disconnect. They don't feel welcomed, they don't feel loved, they don't feel like they fit, they don't feel accepted. It's somewhere in there that caused that trigger, that turned that light on in their brain, like, you know, I'm gonna go to do this. I'm gonna go do this because it changes how I feel. I won't have to feel this. So I advise if anybody, you know, you have a friend, a spouse, a loved one, a sibling, relative, whatever, mm -hmm. If they're dealing with addiction, do not give up on them because I promise you that's not gonna, scare tactics don't work with addicts. I, d I did fentanyl, so you think, I'm not scared, I'm clearly not scared of nothing. <laughs> that's the most deadliest drug out right now. So it's just, if you keep being there for them, but don't let them take advantage of you because we can be very sneaky and vindictive, I know this. But love from a distance, but don't not love at all because that connection if they see that you're trying and you care and they know that they're hurting you and hurting you, but you're still there, they're gonna be like, dang, like, I can't keep hurting you. Like, when I had my family session in rehab, I seen my mom cry and I haven't seen her cry like that in a long time. And it just, I already wanted to stay sober, but when I seen that, I was like, oh. Felt like I got shot. I was like, no, I can't keep doing this to her. I can't, I refuse. Wow. And it really did help. So just try to be there for that person. If you are young and you have friends who's doing perks, getting drunk every night. Every time y'all go somewhere, they gotta have a bottle or like whatever it is, keep your distance because you are who you hang around. If you're not then, you will be eventually. That's right. So, I mean, Thank honestly, there's, there's really not much more I could say, but just watch who you hang around because in my Bible it says, bad association spoils useful habits. So. Absolutely. Just keep that in mind. But I appreciate y'all listening to my chatterbox self. And um, if y'all want to hear more and learn more about all this crazy stuff, follow my Instagram, the Lauren Dior, and I'm follow me, DM me. I will respond to you, and I'll you know interact because I just want to help everybody. So thank you for listening. Thank you so.
much for that um, amazing, amazing Lauren. And uh, no, baby, you could come just sit right here. Uh, <laughs> but but thank you so much for sharing, and definitely your story was inspiring. And prayfully, you are going to help many others. So thank you so much, love. And then we have Miss Enchanted PR, Crystal Jordan, that's going to talk to us about effective communication in mental health. Thank you so much, Crystal. cheerleader too we got that 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 cheerleader voice but um first of all i just want to say thank you so much to lauren for sharing that story and for being candid can we give her another hand that takes a lot of courage to do and so for you to be able to do that so young um it's definitely a testament to the fact that you're on the right path and we're proud of you so i wanted to say that um so I want to tell you guys a little bit about myself. I want to talk. I was very honored when uh, Merle asked me to be a part of this and my uh, friend Marsha because I feel like my job for so long, my, my comp company's name is Enchanted PR, as, as um, she told you all, and I did publicity, right? So my job is making things look perfect. So I started doing PR way before Instagram. I'm a lot older than Lauren. <laughs> um, started doing PR way before that. And my job was basically to um, put clients, celebrities in magazines, and we would make everything look perfect. Because in order to get people to buy into things, really, you have to convince them that what they're buying into is better than themselves, right? So. I did PR for a couple of corporate organizations and then, work, and then moved to Atlanta and I started working with celebrities. And so it was very exciting. It's a, I love it, right? I love being able to be a part of creating things and we're doing photo shoots with celebrities and things like that. But after a while I started looking at things and I was like, wait a minute, I have a daughter at home, right? And I'm helping create things that don't look real at all. Like we'll do a photo shoot with a beautiful celebrity and then the photographer will take those photos, take about 300 to 400 sh pictures at a photo shoot, and then he goes through those, and we pick three, right? And then from those three, we edit, Photoshop the crap out of them. And then by the time they get on the front of the magazine, it really doesn't look anything like that original photo, right? And these women are already beautiful, but because we're focusing on what is gonna sell and what is is uh, the public standard, you we create this situation that does not look realistic. We take off any type of cellulite. We take off any type of blemishes. We smooth out edges so you can't even tell it's a lace front. Like it just, to the point where I started to feel guilty because I'm like, I'm being a part of creating a false narrative that I know little girls are looking at because I remember being a little girl and looking at Right On Magazine, which I know none of you have heard of, and that's okay. <laughs> but looking at magazines and looking at things and thinking, wow, how does her hair look like that? Like, what's wrong with me, right? And so I realized, as I, I remember being on a call with a, with a record label and they were talking about a, a female celebrity that was dark skinned. And they were like, well, we can't make her sexy because this is not the look that sexy is. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm really being a part of hurting my community that I love, specifically us. I always, I grew up, you know, a lot like Lauren. I think most of us do, trying to figure out who we are, what, what, you know, what, what our value is, comparing ourselves to each other. And we all know in our culture, our as African American and women of color, we weren't necessarily considered what was beautiful for a long time. You guys are, are in a very different, we're in a very different place right now. So when I was growing up, you didn't, no one that looked like me was on television, save Janet Jackson, which was where I loved her. But everybody else looked very different. And so it was really hard to find, you know, ways to connect with who you are because you didn't see that. Um, so I realized, I was like, you know what, Crystal, I love doing PR, but I really wanna be a part of helping young women understand that what they see and the reality is not necessarily the same things, right? So in that period of time, I've worked with, I remember working with Sierra when she was young and Sierra was absolutely beautiful from the time she was 17 is when I worked with her. 
she used to call me Miss Crystal, and she was so sweet, but she still, we would get blog posts like, oh, well, she's, she's too tall, is she this? And it's like, there's never a point where society says a person is perfect. And if they are perfect, or society is saying they are, best believe they have been manipulated and photoshopped and all of those things. So what I wanna talk to you guys about today is how do you stay strong? How do you as mothers be able to help your daughters understand that they are beautiful? And how do you as young women, because at a certain point your mother's not gonna be able to be in your head. Like Lauren just shared her story and even though her mother and father and probably you know family members were very supportive, at some point you have to understand this is what I have to do for myself. I've gotta figure out how to love myself and how to get control of my mind, right? And so what I wanna share with you guys today, first of all, I'm gonna start with the Bible verses. It's one of my favorite Bible verses. Um, I believe that everything that is going on, a lot of times people think the Bible is like an old book and it's not relative, but if you actually read it, most of our issues are answered in there. <laughs> so this is the, the scripture that I'm going to start with today. And it says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And it's in Proverbs. Proverbs is one of my favorite books because it talks a lot about how to be wise and how to deal with people and how to make sure that you stay out of trouble. Like it just has a lot of really good 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 information and wisdom. So I would say to anybody, if you want to start reading the Bible or you don't know what books to read, Proverbs is great um, because it's just real life, common sense stuff, right? Um, so above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it, right? So our heart and our minds are connected, right? So we know that what we, what we see goes into our eyes, we think about it, and then the things that we care about become a part of our heart, right? So I want to talk about how do we guard our hearts and mind? How do we protect what goes into it? Because part of the problem um, we heard Lauren talk about when she would compare herself to other girls, right? She was, girls were bullying her. You guys have social media. I cannot imagine what it must feel like to be a teenager in this in this culture because when we were growing up we just had to focus on the girls in school like you had to compare yourself with probably around 500 people but at this point it's the world so you really have to understand how to make sure that you are guarding your heart and guarding your mind because guess what your mind is like a computer right your mind actually is what computers were built based on so what happens when you go to sites that are not necessarily what if you go to a site that's like a, a, a porn site or a bad site? What happens to your computer? Anybody know? No one's been to a bad site? You guys are all great kids, that's awesome. <laughs> if you go to a site that you probably shouldn't be on, you would get your computer could get spammed, right? And that can cause your computer to lock up. So the same thing happens with your brain. When you are constantly looking at negative things or looking at things that you're comparing yourself to, you're spamming your brain. Right. And so just like the computer, you know, we put a virus protect, we put a virus uh, protector on our computer to keep bad things from coming on there. And how do they get bad things when you go to sites that are not necessarily right? It may not even be like a porn site or a, or, or, a, a, a adult or mature site. It could just be something that um, someone has put to trick you. It could be something, a link that you click on that puts a virus on your computer. So you have to be careful to make sure that you have a protector on your computer. You have to do the same thing with your brain. So how do we do that? How do we do that? I'm gonna give you guys three S's for how we protect our minds, how we protect our hearts. The first one is to realize that we have to stop spamming our brain. How, who's on Instagram in here? Everybody's on Instagram, right? Anybody not on Instagram? Okay, all right. So, <laughs> so we're all on Instagram. So your Instagram feed is filled with things that you look at, right? So I have, I'm a big animal lover, right? So I look at pages about dogs. So because I look at pages about dogs, Instagram sends me a bunch more pages about dogs, right? Also, because I'm in entertainment, I look at celebrity-driven sites. So Instagram sends me a bunch more celebrity sites. Mm -hmm. As women, we always love beauty, right? So you look at beauty sites, it's gonna send you a lot of that. Now, unfortunately, what Instagram also does is it doesn't send you things that it doesn't think you're interested in, right? So you have to create your own algorithm. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. 
you are creating your algorithm. So if you are looking at, if you're constantly looking at women that are, you know, makeup tutorials and you're constantly looking at other girls that are bragging about what they have, that's gonna keep coming at you, <laughs> right? And most of us don't even realize that we're the ones programming our own algorithms. Now I'm not saying Instagram won't throw some things in there, but a lot of it is based scientifically on what you what pages you visit. So my advice to you, I've learned a long time ago working with, like I said, some of the most successful people in the world. What do successful people do that people that are not successful don't do? People that are successful, number one, they, <laughs> they always think in a positive way about themselves, right? And that's not easy to do. But they're also disciplined, right? So you look at people that the girl has a really nice, well, let's, let's not say that because now we have plastic surgery and a lot of other stuff. But typically, if someone is in shape and they look really good, it took a lot of work to get there, right? So we understand that it takes work to get our bodies in a physical great place, but it also takes work to make sure our minds are in a good place as well. So stop spamming your brain. That means when you look at your Instagram feed, I would challenge you guys to go through your feed and unfollow any pages that are not going to give you the results that you want, right? If you are looking at pages that are constantly making you feel bad about yourself, all you have to do is unfollow, <laughs> unfollow, right? Because you're creating your reality, just like we could go in the cafeteria, you know, and there'd be all these people around, and finally I just learned, you know what, I don't like those girls, so I'm gonna stay away from them. They make me irritated, so I'm gonna stay away. I keep myself away from things that upset me, right? So what I'm gonna challenge you to do is if there's something, it doesn't have to be something negative, but if it's something that triggers you, if it's something that makes you feel insecure about yourself, do the right thing for yourself and unfollow it, right? Because that your, your, your phone is yours. Nobody has to know what you're following, right? So that's the first thing, stop spamming your brain. Realize that what you put in is gonna be what you put out, right? What you take in, what you look at, that becomes what you're focused on. Just like that algorithm starts throwing you things constantly that you're focused on. And it's shaping the way your brain works. That discipline, is, is it sounds easy, but I know it's not. But that's the first step in getting control of who you are. If you wanna love yourself, you gotta stop triggering yourself to see things that upset you. And I know as a, young, as a woman, period, it doesn't have to be a young woman. There are women, you know, of all ages, we all want to feel beautiful. We all want to feel attractive. And sometimes looking at other people and comparing ourselves is the first step to not feeling that way. So if something is making you feel bad, stop spamming yourself with it, right? The second thing is silence the haters. First, stop spamming. Second, silence the haters. Now, you know what the biggest problem is? Who is our biggest, most of us, the biggest hater to most of us is who? Ourselves, yeah. hands down, <laughs> right? So most of us are, yes, we may have other people around us to say negative things, but the person in the mirror is who has the biggest influence on you, mm -hmm. right? So if you're taking things that you've been told or if you fail at something and you're taking that, man, I never can get this right. I hate how my body looks. I hate how my face looks. I hate my hair. You are your biggest hater, right? You are gonna be the biggest influence on you. So you have to figure out what you want that influence to be. Do you want to be an influencer that, do you wanna influence yourself to be positive and to love yourself so that others will love you? Or are you gonna beat yourself up? Because guess what? Other people learn to treat us based on how we treat ourselves. That's right. So when you see someone who is confident, not, not cocky and, and full of it, right? Because some people are loud and act like they're confident, but we know they're not. But if people see that you have a problem with yourself, they're gonna have a problem with you too. So you have to get a hold on what it is about yourself. If you have a problem with it, you've gotta learn how to fix it. But you have to learn how to change the words that you say to yourself. My uncle gave me a book one time because I, I struggled with this way past 20. <laughs> way past 20, right? I think I was in my early 30s, and I have a daughter and a son, but I know from my daughter, you know, as a mother, you know that your daughter learns how to take care of herself based on how you take care of yourself, yeah. right? Your daughter learns how to love herself based on how you love yourself. So I wanted my daughter to see me feeling better about myself, and I knew I needed to work on my self-esteem to get 
so that I would pattern a, a great example for her. And so my uncle, who was a, a, a business coach, he gave me a book that says, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself, mm. right? And that book was instrumental in me changing my outlook because I want you all to know that this is not something that everybody, I have been in the rooms with some of the most beautiful women in the world. I remember sitting at a table, and I think I've told Marsha about this, sitting at a table with Taraji and Kelly Rowland and Gabrielle Union and Chili. Right, so I represent TLC. Chili was doing an event, and they were all at this VH1 honors, and then me. Right? So I remember thinking, why am I at this table with these women? <laughs> like I know everybody is looking at them like, okay, we understand why they're here, but what is she doing here? Right. So that was going on in my head. Like I don't want to be at this table, and I Chili was like, come on, sit down. I, was like, I don't want to sit down because you know, Kelly Rowland looks like a whole Barbie. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so, but the thing about it was nobody else was thinking that but me. Crystal was being the biggest hater to herself. So I had to learn very simply what to say when I talked to myself. So what I started to do was write down comfort, uh, affirmations. If everybody heard about that, anybody done affirmations mm -hmm. before? Yes. I would just write little things. And you guys, I swear to you, if you all that are under 20 or under 25 start doing this, at this age, by the time you get to be in your 30s and 40s, you will be on some difference. You will be a whole different animal, right? Mm -hmm. We will be so proud of you. If you can start to do that now, write down, and if it, you don't have to start with a bunch, just write down, I am beautiful, right? Or I, what you like about yourself. And every time you feel yourself saying something negative, correct it. Because I had a lifetime, I, I'm up until 31, 32, I had a lifetime of saying, Crystal, you're too this, you're not this, you're not good at this, you're not, oh, you, no, you can't do this. I had a lifetime of saying that. So I had to start reprogramming my brain. And it worked. It was slow, it was a slow process, but I promise you it will work. Every time, my uncle gave me this example, so I put a rubber band around my wrist until I could figure out how to stop doing that. And every time I'd have a negative thought, if I went someplace and, my hair fell, I'd be like, oh my God, your hair looks good. I'll pull the, the rubber band and snap my wrist, oh right? My and that was a way for me to train my brain to stop, stop, stop. Another thing I had to learn how to do was when women, you know, we see each other and we say, oh, you look so pretty. First thing we do is, no, 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 no. <laughs> had to say, thank you. Learn how to say, yes. thank you. I want to challenge everybody here. When someone gives you a compliment, you are so handsome, just a, a very handsome young man, say, thank you, <laughs> see that? Yes, yes, yes. Very beautiful young woman. And I, I also have to say, I want to cram a lot of stuff in here because I really want to leave this with you guys. I think this is so important. This is the biggest problem for mental health today. There is no face for mental health issues, mm. right? You have people who look, I can tell you when I looked the best, when I had my company was going, I was hanging out with all these celebrities, I was probably the most depressed because I wasn't happy with myself. You can't see it. Nobody, everybody else thought, oh, girl, you look good. You snatched. You got, but I was miserable because I wasn't taking care of myself. So there's no, there's no way to, to, to detect. It's all about what's going on up here. And the first step to that, I'm not saying that some of us may not need medication, therapy, all that helps. I went to therapy. All of that helps. But the most important thing that you can do is learn to restructure and reprogram the way you deal with yourself. Okay. So we're gonna stop spamming our brain with things that we don't need, mm -hmm. right? If you don't need to look at Ari, you know, because <laughs> maybe that makes you feel bad about, then, then unfollow Ari, right? <laughs> if you don't need to look at money bag yo, because you don't have the money yet and it makes you feel, then unfollow, <laughs> unfollow. Because guess what? He's gonna keep on making money. It's not hurting him. But you have to be responsible for what you're doing with your brain. After you stop spamming, then you're going to silence the hater, most importantly you, you're the one that you can control. You can't control what other people think about you. You can't control what other people say about you. But guess what? If I know Crystal is good and you decide you don't like Crystal, I'm okay with that. That's your business. I'm good, right? Yeah. But if I don't like Crystal and then you say something about Crystal, now I'm hurt. Now I feel like, oh my God, maybe she's right because I think it already. So the first thing that you, can, that you need to do is make sure that you are silencing the negative words and thoughts that are coming from you about you. Most powerful thing you can learn. The last thing is you're gonna start to supply your brain with love and positivity, right? So first you wanna stop 
then we want to silence, then we want to start putting positivity back in ourselves. I think we are teaching, and I'll take this on myself and the other ladies in the room that, have, that are of a particular age, right? We've experienced a little bit. It's our responsibility to show you all that are younger that there is more to life than beauty mm. and money, yeah. right? Because there's always gonna be someone that's beautiful. Beauty is not, I remember when I first moved here, my goal, I remember I would pray, like I just wanna be pretty, I just wanna be pretty. And then I remember I moved here and I was having a conversation and this guy said, okay, so you know, you, you're pretty, but then what? I was like, well then what? <laughs> that's what I got, <laughs> that's what I got, right? No, my mother always would tell me I was smart. Right, but my mother never told me I was pretty. So then I had this imbalance. What you need to understand is that beauty and external looks, if you put your faith and your value in that, that is going to change and it's not enough. It's not enough because God made you so much more amazing than just what your external looks like. And the only way that you can put your faith in beauty is if you have to say, well, I'm beautiful and she's not, right? But if you say we're all beautiful, then that kind of takes away the value. It's like, ah, all right. Because girls love saying, well, I'm prettier than Jen. If you put your faith in that, you're going to have problems <laughs> down the road. Because what you, will, what you will learn to understand is that beauty is not subjective. There's nothing in here that says only this woman here in the orange can be beautiful, right? Just the way, just her features only. And girls, guys, find beauty everywhere, just so y'all know, right? <laughs> just so you know. I done talked to probably a few more guys than you guys have. I done ha hung out with celebrity rappers and, and athletes, and guess what? Guys can look at her and say, I like her hair, I like her face, I like her body, I like, the like, men can find beauty everywhere, so what do you have to do? You have to learn how to know that you, number one, are beautiful, but most importantly, I'm beautiful because of who I am. If you put all your faith in the fact how you can put on makeup and how your hair looks, child, that's going to, you're going you're gonna to run into some trouble <laughs> down the road. But that's so, I, I just, I want to make sure, that's a whole nother conversation, but I want to make sure you understand you have to love yourself and you have to love yourself for you. For you. you can't love yourself because you, your hair looks good that day. Because guess what? Tomorrow your hair may not look like that. <laughs> You only gonna love yourself based on that, you're gonna run into some trouble. If you only love yourself when you're a certain size, right? I had two kids, I had a super cute shape after having my daughter. Had my son and oh my God. <laughs> if my relationship with Crystal was based on that, that changed, that goes up and down, right? And I have to know that I'm Crystal regardless of how big I am or how small I am or how shaped I am. That's not what makes me Crystal. Now, I can try to be the best crystal I can be, but that's not who makes me myself. I have to learn to love myself for me, right? I would say to you, young ladies, practice one more thing for me, please. And this is different with your generation. You know, we all pull up Instagram and Snapchat, right? And we all put the filter on our face, right? I promise you, if you cannot look at yourself without that filter, and love yourself, that's gonna be a problem. It's gonna be a problem, right? And you know why it's gonna be a problem? Because that's not you. And when you meet people, and when you talk to people, and you go for a job, or you go to talk to a guy, he's not seeing that filter. So, so many of us, we're, we're creating mental issues for our young women because we're, we're, we're encouraging them to put this filter on. This filter looks like a Kim Kardashian type, I don't, I don't look like that. I'm not saying that, that you should never use it, but what I'm saying is fall in love with you. Fall in love with you. And how do you do that? Because I know that sounds like rhetoric. How do you do that? Step by step. You know what? I like my eyes. That's special to me, right? Next thing you know, find something else about yourself that you like and keep saying those things to yourself. Things that you don't like, what do you do? Silence that. Silence that. And pretty soon you'll start to grow and your brain will start to be trained to think the way you want to think. And that's a brain that's built for success and health. A brain that is constantly telling you what you're doing wrong and why you don't look good and why you're not enough is a brain that's gonna lead you to anxiety, a brain that's gonna lead you to addiction, and it's a brain that's ultimately gonna take you away from success, right? Because it's really difficult to be 
in a place God opens a door for you, gives you an opportunity. It's really hard to walk through that door if you don't love yourself. It's really hard to walk through that door if you don't feel worthy. So you have to do the work to get yourself in that space. So I would say love the beauty, all the amazing beauty products that we have nowadays. We all love them. But at the end of the day, the end of the day, you have got to learn how to be able to get out of the shower and look at yourself, your beautiful self, the way God made you and realize there's value. There's so much value there, right? I went through a divorce early on. I got married a few years ago. And when I go out, usually um, I've got makeup on and hair done and, you know, it's easy to promote this image, right? But when you're in a real relationship, and those of you that are married in the room, you know, <laughs> that's not the reality of what that person sees every night. I was talking to an influencer, a very, very popular one. I'm not going to say who she was because I don't want to put her business out, but she told me that she was dating this rapper, and she would get up every morning before he woke up, and she would put a full face of makeup on. Wow. And her lace, he'd never seen her without her lace front. And all her friends were congratulating her because they were like, because she got, I mean, this, this guy had the bag, right? She was definitely in a good place. But I remember thinking, like, that's not going to last because that's not real, mm-hmm. right? And I know that we're giving you, we're, we're, society is telling you all that that's what you aim for. But I can promise you from someone who's been on the other side and talked to those people, do you think that she's with that rapper now? She's not with him anymore because that's not real, right? If you can't learn to love yourself for who you are, nobody else is gonna do it either because you teach people how to treat you. You are the one that basically creates the algorithm for your life, not just Instagram, but your life. If I walked in here and my energy wasn't positive and I was nervous and I was, then you guys would probably be like, I don't know, she knows what she's talking about. (laughs) She talking like she don't really know what she's talking about. But because I know, I know that God wants me to tell young women this. I know that this is what I'm supposed to do. I know you can feel that because I know it. I I know it like I know my name is Crystal Danielle Jordan. I have so many female friends that are successful, beautiful, have money, and a lot of them are not happy. You know why? Because they never did what I'm telling you to do now. They never learned how to love themselves. So that what they did is they went and they got weave and a job and a degree and a house and stocks and bonds and a, and a bad car and a bag. And guess what? You take all that away, they don't know who they are. They're unhappy. And that's not wrong. That just means a lot of us didn't, didn't know how to do this work when we were your age. So you have the, you have the, the benefit of being able to learn from our mistakes. I didn't learn to fall in love with Crystal until Crystal was old, (laughs) much older, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a beautiful process. And my goal is to tell as many young women as possible. If I could go back and talk to Crystal when she was 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, I would tell her that everything that she needs to be successful, she already has. The problem is she doesn't know it. She has to learn to love herself. And that's what I want to encourage you guys to do. It may not be something that you can do overnight, but I promise you can start to make those steps. You can stop spamming your brain with things that make you unhappy. You can stop, silence the negative talk that you tell yourself. And number one, I mean, number three, you can supply yourself with self-love and positivity, right? And I promise you, if you do that for six months, you will start to see a change in the way people respond to you and most importantly, the way you feel about yourself. All right? Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Boy, you guys are dropping gems. So, oh my God, thank you so much. And Miss Ayana, can you come and share with us um, your story in this industry and how you birthed that, um, your brand that you have there? So, hi you guys. Uh, Today we're gonna be discussing beauty, self-esteem, the benefits of self-care, how it's important to show up as the best version of yourself, and how every day the best version of yourself is different. 
we're going to be discussing um, your vaginal health and your gut health and your brain health. So honestly, when I was asked to participate and when she told me what she wanted me to talk about, I was like, I don't know how in the world I'm going to talk about vaginas and pH balance and like how is it going to be making sense at an event like this when I talk about mental health and addiction. Um, but there is a connection and I'm so glad that she asked me to speak on it because since I started this business and I did more research, I've learned so much about how we have almost three brains three brains. <laughs> so our brain and our stomach and our vagina, they all have a nerve that connects to one another. And um, how we take care and treat all three is it goes hand in hand. So that's what we're going to discuss. But before we get into it, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, what I do and why what I do is important to me. So my name is Ayana and I go by Ayana Hanaya. That's my brand. So y'all, I get nervous talking to people, so I might talk fast or look around a lot, but it's not because I don't know what I'm talking about. It's just because I get nervous. Um, so when I was little, I wanted to be like Oprah. I wanted to be like two people, Oprah and Michael Jackson, but I figured it was more, <laughs> I figured it was easier to be like Oprah than like Michael Jackson, but Michael Jackson was like my crush for life. So that's where I got the Ayana Hanaya from because Oprah's business is called Harpo Productions and that's her name backwards, which is a palindrome. So, because a lot of people ask me about the Ayana Hanaya, so I figured I'd share. It was by being inspired by her. So with my brand, Ayana Hanaya, I basically help women start, run, and grow their businesses. So I've been an entrepreneur for um, a little over, t almost 10 years. I'm 32. I have two children, a boy and a girl. I'm the oldest of five, and those two back there are my sisters, Chelsea and Gabrielle. And if you know anything about Myers-Briggs personality types, I am an ENFP and proud of it. <laughs> I'm a master cosmetologist and a salon owner, and um, we celebrated seven years this year. I have a boutique in, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, I have two boutiques, one in Snellville and one in Beaufort. I have multiple online stores, and recently a girl became an Amazon partner, so I'm really excited about that. With my business back there, I also help women uh, grow in business. Currently, we wholesale, and we're in 17 spas, including Australia and the UK. So I'm happy to be here, and I believe in transparency, so I wanted to let y'all know that because this is really my first time speaking on this particular topic, I wrote everything down. So <laughs> I'll be reading it, but I will also like talk off grid a little bit. Okay, so why what I do is important to me is because I love women. I love watching or helping women succeed and just live their best life. So my mom has been doing hair since I was two, and I'm 32. So technically I've been in the hair industry for a lot longer than my seven year salon span. And I remember I would be little and watching her do hair and I'll be so annoyed. I'm like, she just talking to all these people. She got like five and six people in here at a time. I gotta wash everybody's hair. I'll be so irritated. but. Every Friday and Saturday, the same group of women would always come and be so excited to get their hair done. And when I was little, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why they were so excited to speak to my mama, because I couldn't stand her <laughs> when I was little, which a lot of young girls can't stand their moms when they're younger, but that was my truth. I was just like, why are all these people so happy to talk to her? <laughs> Truthfully, you know, I just, I didn't get it. Um, but now that I'm a hairstylist, now that I'm a big sister, I get it. I get why people, are happy to have an outlet and happy to go somewhere where they can feel free in their rawest form before they get transformed into the divas that we're all born to be. Um, so I don't know if y'all heard this before, but I heard this thing about how don't turn yourself into bite-sized pieces like you can let people choke. Have y'all heard that? No? So when I was little, I struggled with um, having a voice and like speaking up for myself. And then a few years ago, I heard the saying of, you know, don't shrink yourself down into bite-sized pieces. Just show up whole and let them choke. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna just start letting people choke. And I was like, I was really excited about it because, you know, at 32, you would think, or I used to think by the time I'm 25, I'll have my life together. And it just, it doesn't work out that way. Um, but when I turned 30, I realized that my voice was important and it was important for me to show up as my authentic self and that, Whoever didn't like it, they just didn't have to be in my circle. And I think that that's really freeing. 
So that's what I want other women to do too, just to show up as themselves, no matter what that may be. If you're nervous like me when you talk, say it and own it, you know? Um, and that's, that's what it's all about. So I wanna start off with a story. About six years ago, I had a client. She said I could say her name, but I won't. I asked her if I could talk about her before I came here. So she booked her appointment, and in the notes online when she booked the appointment, I don't know why, but she said, I don't wanna get my hair done, but my therapist told me I should, so you can do whatever you want. And I was just like, okay. So <laughs> when she came, I'm talking to her, I'm like, you know, so what do you like? And you know, what do you think about this? And uh, we had a little consultation before her appointment, and she told me, you know, I don't really wanna be here. I don't, I don't wanna get my hair done. I don't wanna get my nails done. I don't wanna do this stuff. But my therapist said that I'm about to graduate therapy. I didn't know you could graduate therapy because I had never gone to therapy this six years ago. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, she's kicking me out, basically. And I was like, okay. And she said the next thing she wanted her to do was to get outside beautiful the same way she's been getting inside beautiful. So she told her to get her nails done, take a spa day, get her hair done, and just do things so that she could see herself on the outside, like how she had been feeling on the inside. So at first she told me, you know, this is dumb. She wants me to decorate my house. I don't ever have company. She was like, I don't need my hair done. There's no man in my life. And I remember doing her hair at the time I was married. And I remember doing her hair and thinking like, man, this 50 something year old lady is talking about she can't decorate because nobody's coming over, you know, or she doesn't want to look good because of a man. And I didn't get it. So I told her, I was like, you know, making your house comfortable and making it beautiful is for you, for you to walk inside and feel warm and feel cozy and love every part of it. And so after we talked, fast forward some, this is, I guess, two years later, 28 at this time, and now I'm divorced. And so I told her, I was like, hey, remember when I was telling you, like, I think it is a good idea to decorate and do all this stuff and start over? I was like, I did the same thing. I threw away everything I had with my ex-husband, like the TV, the couch, the toilet seats, my stepdad changed them all. Like, it was like insane, but <laughs> I did. <laughs> but I started everything over, and it was, it was really transforming. I didn't know how it was gonna affect me the way it did. Even my son's room. I was like, I didn't want us to have any of the memories that we had before. I just wanted to be brand new, but I didn't wanna leave my house. So <laughs> right, you like, yeah, that ain't it, that ain't it. So when I decorated my house and I put up things that said like, you're beautiful, going down my steps is a sign that says, choose happy. There's a mirror to the left of my door and for about three years I had a sticky note that was just like, yes, girl. <laughs> and just little things that just make myself feel good. So anyway, to go back to the six years ago story, I did her hair, I did her lashes and I was, just talking and telling her how I'm glad she came and I was glad I met her. And when I turned her around to look at her hair and look at her lashes, I did her lashes for free because I wanted her to vent a little bit more because she seemed like she was really into it when she was talking. So I turned her around after doing her hair and she cried. And she was like, wow, like I didn't even know this could be so transformative and make me feel so powerful. And I think that that was when I really realized that me doing hair was more than just making people look good, that it really made them feel good too. So why does it matter? Why does my client's story matter? Or what I did after a divorce? It matters because it connects the beauty being internal and external. And that how you feel about yourself shows in how you treat yourself, like Miss Crystal was saying. It shows in how you show up for yourself. It shows in how you treat other people. It directly affects your day-to-day -day life and your decision making. And a lot of times people hear beauty and they just think like, that's just what's on the outside. That's just lashes. That's just makeup. And it, it starts within, but then it glows without. So when you start to do your work inside, I think you should also do your work outside because then you just create the life that you just want to live. There's a saying that says, I, I create the life that I don't need a vacation from. And I'm all about that. <laughs> I am all about that. Yeah, you too. <laughs> I'm all about that. So I, I'm all about creating a life I don't need a vacation from, building businesses that my sisters can come be with me to participate in. And I came and spoke with um, her before on a podcast and my daughter came with me. So I, I think it's important to build a life that you love. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about how to build your self-esteem because you can't build a life that you love if you have low self-esteem because kind of like a circle. You're not really loving the life that you're living to build it if you're not really showing up for yourself and loving yourself properly. So let's dive into some roles that having a healthy self-esteem contribute to. 
So I'm gonna give y'all like some bullet points. So if you wanna write them down, you can. If not, that's cool, but just want you to know. So the first thing is your emotional well-being. So healthy self-esteem is linked to better emotional well-being. Like Ms. Crystal was saying, when you have a positive self-esteem, you're more likely to experience positive emotions. You have better coping mechanisms when facing difficulties. I'll give you an example of when people say the cup is half full or it's half empty. Our dad is a very half empty kind of guy. Whenever I tell him a business idea, he's like choppy. He calls me choppy because my cheeks used to be like a lot bigger than this when I was little. And he'd be like, choppy, I don't know. Like that's a lot of money. I don't know if you could do that, you know. It might be easier to just do something else. And then whenever I do it, he's like, I'm so proud of you. When am I going to retire, you know? <laughs> and then you have the people that are the half full. Like, oh my gosh, what can I do with this half a glass of water? I could do a lot. You know, I could make it happen. So your emotional well-being, it has a lot to do with how you decide to cope and how you decide to go and make decisions, whether it's left or right. The second thing is resilience. So a lot of people with higher self-esteem, they tend to be more resilient to setbacks and challenges. The third is a reduced vulnerability to mental health. So yeah, I looked this stuff up, and it was in an uh, article from July 2021. Her name is Ariana Stiles. And she said that low self-esteem is a risk factor for various mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, eating disorders, negative self-perceptions that can contribute to negative thought patterns and feeling of worthlessness. And that 41% of young girls and women at ages 6 to 23 suffer from eating disorders because of their low self-esteem. So I looked that up and I wanted to point it out because it's crazy how much what you feel about yourself can really do to your outside world. Number four is healthy relationships. So your positive self-esteem enables you to establish and maintain healthier relationships because when you value yourself, you're more likely to set healthy boundaries and you want people around you who value you too. I was going to give an example, but I don't want to talk about my ex-husband no more, so I'm not going to give an example because <laughs> I wrote down my example and I'm like, I don't want to say it. So anyway, <laughs> number five is motivation and achievement. So higher self-esteem is associated with a greater sense of self-efficacy, which leads to an increased motivation and helps you pursue your personal goals. So now that we discuss raising your self-esteem and how it can improve your mental health, I want to talk about investing in self-care. So I didn't know it, but I have been talking about self-care for years on my Instagram. And last year when I wanted to pivot and kind of change direction, somebody suggested, like, why don't you do lifestyle and self-care? Because you you share business stuff all the time. That's what I would normally do and discuss and talk about is like marketing, branding, um, customer service, building a business, how to do wholesale. And they were like, you know, you should kind of pivot and talk about lifestyle and like self-care because you'll post something about a business, but all your examples have something to do with how you feel or how you show up. And I was like, okay. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about some self-care things that you can do that can help you be your best self. The first thing you could do is practice self-compassion. I will say that I am so hard on myself. So like even here today, so I'm 225 pounds and I'm so mad about it because in January I was 200 pounds. And I was just like, what is wrong with me? Like I didn't gain all this weight. I went to an event and they were taking pictures and all I could see is my double chin. But then everybody else was like, girl, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful. And like with one of her S's, like if we just hate on ourselves, we're our self-haters. And I was just like, while she was talking, I'm like, I need to get over myself, you know? <laughs> and give myself some compassion, you know? So treat yourself with some compassion and kindness and understanding because honestly, we give it to other people. I know me in relationships, I've given so much grace and so much compassion to somebody else and they treated me like this because of this or, oh, they had that going on. And I don't ever give it to myself. Uh, my best friend died last year and I went through a period where I just sucked at everything. I was sleeping for months. And I said to one of my girlfriends, I was like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm so irritated with myself. I've been sleeping all the time. I'm waking up late. And she's like, your best friend died. That's what's wrong with you. And I'm like, no, but that shouldn't stop what I'm doing. And she's like, what would you say to me if my best friend died? You know, what would you say? And I'm like, I would tell you that that's been your best friend for 14 years. Like, it's OK. Just relax. And she's like, so the next time you're so hard on yourself, ask yourself, what would I tell Brittany if she told me what I'm telling her right now? And I was like, okay, I can do that. And so it's hard to give yourself compassion. It's hard to show up for yourself the way that you show up for others because we're hard on ourselves and we put so much pressure on ourselves to be something that nobody else really even expects for us to be. 
Number two is set boundaries. I suck at this, but I'm getting better at it. I'm working on it because I went to therapy and I, I've learned you have to like get into a relationship with a therapist so you can leave them if you want to and go find a new one and don't stick with it if it's not working for you. But when I went to therapy, it was a questionnaire. And when I filled out the questionnaire, she was like, well, that's part of the problem. Your boundaries suck. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> like, that's a, that's a thing to say on a, you know, your, your first therapy session. But she was right. My boundaries did suck. I always said yes. I never said I don't feel like it. I never said I'm too tired. I never said I'm not OK. I just felt like I needed to show up and show out for everybody else. So setting boundaries is really important. I'm just going to say prioritize your mental health, I mean your physical health, but I don't be doing that all the time, but I just wanted to make sure I said it so that y'all know it's important to prioritize your, your physical health. <laughs> um, number four is engage in activities that you actually enjoy. It doesn't have to be something that makes you money. And I've had to like make myself do that too. I love to paint. Painting does not make me money. Sometimes the paintings look like, oh, you know, and that's okay. It, I enjoy it. It's peaceful. I have wine a lot. Of the <laughs> you know, a few glasses, and I just paint and I enjoy it. And then I put it in my closet and I don't ever look at it again, but it just brought me some type of peace of mind. Connect with supportive people. That's number five. Like Miss Dior was saying, it's really important to have connection. For me, I had to learn that I needed to open up more when I wasn't okay instead of just suffering in silence. Number six is mindfulness and relaxation. I personally, I like to pray. And I like, I don't, no, I don't like to journal, but I found that journaling helps me. So I do that. It helps you too, yeah. But I hate writing. Yeah. <laughs> but I've learned that it helps me. It helps me to do that. It helps me to pray. Um, I've also, I have a playlist that I play every morning, and it's called My Morning Medicine. My, one of my sisters back there, she was like, is it, is it, does it really say morning medicine? I'm like, yes, just be quiet. We're listening to this. And, <laughs> and it, I just, you know, it helps. Uh, Number seven is positive self-talk. Then number eight is to find a venting partner. So me and my cousin, we have these Tuesday night sessions. It's at 1030. It's every Tuesday night. And we get to just go off about everything. And it, it, I didn't know it was going to be helpful at first. But when we set it up, it's like the whole week goes by and I can't wait till Tuesday to just go off about everything <laughs> to my cousin. And she can't wait either. And it's just like a free space to just talk about what I want in a judgment-free zone. So do that. Number nine, I have uh, to limit the self-comparison. But Ms. Crystal already did a fantastic job talking about that, so I won't. <laughs> uh, lastly, I have to celebrate yourself and engage in growth and learning. I didn't know how much I would enjoy like <sighs> learning new things. I mean, that might sound silly. But after my divorce, I took certifications in different things. I just, I kind of just dug myself out of a hole and discovered a whole new version of me. And I think that when you do that, when you learn about different things and you grow in a different direction, but you're, you're still yourself. And I think a lot of people feel like they can't go do something because then it takes away from who they are. But we're ever growing like a tree with branches and leaves. Like there's so much more to us than just what people can see and that's okay. And celebrate your achievement, achievements is what I said for number 10 because Sometimes people don't clap for you, you know, people don't know what you do all the time. People don't know what, sometimes waking up is a personal achievement, you know? So clap for yourself, let yourself know like, hey, I did this today. Something that I started doing was, um, I used to write a to-do list every morning because I'm home Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I used to feel like every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I needed to get this many things done on my to-do list. And I would not get like anything done on my to-do list. And I would be so mad at me. I be, would be so, I'm stuttering my words because I would be so mad at me. I would be like, man, like, you ain't gonna ever be Oprah if you can't do, <laughs> you laughing. I'm so serious. I'm like, how in the world am I gonna be Oprah if I can't even do my to-do list, you know? And then what I started doing was waking up and just going about my day without the list. And then at night before I went to bed, I would write down what I do or what I did. And that's something I do now all the time. I write down at night what I did during the day. And I'm like, man, I was so productive. And I'm like, I deserve ice cream. Like, I just be so happy now because I'm like, and, you know, because you just realize, I'm like, I cleaned the kitchen. I picked up my son from school. <laughs> like, I did this. I write down everything. I don't care how small it is. Even if I change the toilet tissue in the bathroom, I'm like, man, this list is, is listing, you know? <laughs> 
So in closing, I'd like to talk about the correlation between feeling good on the inside and the outside in a sciencey kind of way. Because like she put on the flyer, it's pH balance, and it's really important. I know a lot of people are like, why? But it is. But first I wanna say that there's a quote that I really like by Susan Weisberry, and it's, I am on my side, I am on my side. And each day I am more and more on my side. And it's such a simple quote, but it just really makes sense because sometimes you have to just tell yourself, if nobody else is in a corner with me, I'm there, okay? All right, <clears throat> so let's explore the connection between your vagina and your stomach and your brain. So if you knew that your brain had a, uh, if your brain and your gut were connected, raise your hand. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> and then if you knew that your brain and your gut and your, uh, I'm going backwards. Your brain and your gut and your vagina were all connected by a nerve. Raise your hand. Okay. So, similar to the brain-gut axis, there's something called a gut-vagina axis. So this refers to the communication system back and forth to your vagina and your gut. They literally communicate. It's a thing called a vagus nerve. It's like your largest nerve, and it connects from the lowest part of your brain past your cervix all the way to the lowest part of your vagina. It goes through your stomach. So any type of disruptive to your pH balance, right? Because your P do y'all know that you have a pH balance for your head, or your head, your brain and your stomach and your vagina? Raise your hand if you knew that. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> because they're all connected by the vagus nerve, when one is disrupted, it can disrupt the other one. So the reason why I'm talking about this is because it directly goes into mental health, and there's a lot of side effects, unfortunately, where if your pH balance is not where it should be, it can severely affect your, your emotional and your mental health. So the gut and the vagina, they host this really unique thing called a microbiome. So a microbiome is like a, collect uh, a collection of organisms, right? And it's bacteria that's in this collection. It's just pretend like a, a clear circle of just bacteria and organisms. So some type of bacteria are good, right? We need healthy, we need good bacteria, and then some are bad. So think of a, a yeast infection or bacterial vaginosis. A lot of times people don't know that that can start in your gut, and then it trickles down to your vagina. But what people also don't know is that sometimes when you're stressing out or when you're not feeling your best, it can disturb your pH balance in your brain then it alerts your gut, and then it can go to your vagina. So sometimes we don't know that something is wrong internally, but our outside is letting us know, hey, this is not okay. <clears throat> so if you have a odor down there, or if you're itching, or you're uncomfortable, or you're queasy, some people may think, oh, let me go to the gynecologist because you know I just got in a, a whatever, I need a pill, or let me just take some medicine, I got acid reflux. You might have some mental stuff going on that you're not dealing with or that you haven't you know, healed from completely. Um, and in correlation to how it goes into the head too, I've had a few clients with um, some interesting scalp conditions and issues, and I would say, like, you should go to the gynecologist and get that, you know, get checked out all the way, because this might be something going on internally that you don't know about, right? And I don't know if this all sounds like way off, but she went, a few of them went to the doctor, went to the gynecologist, and have come back with, like, yeast infections, bacterial vaginosis, and the medicine that the doctor has given them clears up what's going on in their scalp, too, because it's all connected. But then a lot of times these things keep reoccurring and keep coming back, and it's because of what's going on with us mentally and emotionally. It's a disruption in the pH balance in our brain that then goes and affects our gut, that then goes and affects our vagina. So there's multiple case studies about this, but now I wanna just let y'all know about one that was done by Alyssa Liguari, who's an OBGN in the state of Colorado. And in her article, she mentions how the hormone that is really, do y'all know what the hormone that's released when you stress is called? Cortisol, yes. Okay, so she says sometimes your body notices a hormone change before your brain does, and so your body reacts first. In her study, she talks about how with women, our bodies are so connected that one slight thing can be off with our pH balance in our brain, and it'll directly go to our vagina. 
which is vaginal health is so important. And I didn't know this. I started my business a year ago, and that's how I got into it. I was like, oh, this is a, a big deal. Like, our vaginal health can do so much. Think of uh, when you're PMSing or I, I suffer from PMDD, different things that we go through with our menstrual cycle. It directly affects how we feel about ourselves, mood swings, uh, what we have a taste for. It's all connected. So anyway, in her study, she talks about how sometimes you don't even realize that you're so overwhelmed mentally, and because your brain can't recognize it, it starts showing up through your gut and through your vaginal health. She said the research has proven that the effect on cortisol levels from those who are depressed, not doing too well mentally, on the pH balance and the blood flow is overwhelming. She said it increases sexual discomfort, it increases infections, odors, negatively impacts your cycle, can intensify your PMS, has severe negative effects on those who are going through perimenopause. She said the hormone imbalance in the vagina that weakens the protective bacteria can leave you with other issues, including unpleasant discharge, smel smells that are thicker, I'm sorry, unpleasant discharge, thicker than usual discharge, irregular periods, mood swings, prolonged periods of hopelessness, feeling severely depressed and suicidal, having pelvic pains that can mimic those of having, sorry, pelvic pains mimicking those of giving birth, suffer from vaginal dryness and migraines. And that's not even all of it, but I didn't want to just list all in all. So our brain, does anybody know what our brain pH should be? Seven. So does anybody know what pH stands for? Ooh, I like that personal health. <laughs> you know? You know it. <laughs> okay, it's potential hydrogen. So the pH scale is basically just used to tell if you're more acidic or if you're more alkaline and what, what part of your body should be. So the brain should be at a seven, seven to 7.3. Your hair should be at a 3.8 to a five, and your vagina should be around a 4.5 to a 5.5. So of course we can't walk around just knowing the numbers, but it's really, 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 really great to just keep in tune with your body and learn what's going on with what's going on inside of you because the slightest disturbance to your pH in your stomach can affect your brain and how you think about yourself and how you feel. The slightest disturbance in your vag vaginal pH can affect your brain and how you feel about yourself and what you think. And again, like, how do I say it? I'm thankful that she asked me to talk about this because I didn't realize how important that I even thought it was until I was asked to speak about it. When we talked, I was like, you want me to talk about what? And she's like, you can do it. I know you can. And she's like, you know what you're talking about because you were talking to me about it. So you could do it. You could do it. And I'm really appreciative to be able to talk about it because even in studying more and more, I've learned that a disruptive pH balance in your vagina, it can cause panic attacks, it can cause mood disorders, it can cause severe uh, fatigue and drowsiness, and it can mimic the signs of depression. I'm not saying that you might not be depressed or you might not have a mental health you know, disorder, but what I am saying is that sometimes how we take care of ourselves and our brains and our stomachs and our vaginas, that can be what's going on with us too. Um, so, that's it. How do we fix these things? I don't know, because unfortunately, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I can't tell you exactly what to do, but what I can say is that a lot of times as women, we like to, I like to say, put ourselves on a slow cook on the back burner. We're like rice, and we got the rice on that pot in the back, and we're letting it simmer slow, but up front, we're like, making the chicken and making the vegetables and doing all this stuff and cutting stuff up and pouring juice. And we're the rice. And by the time we're done doing all this stuff, you know, the kids, the man, taking all care of all this stuff, we forget that the rice is on, which is us. We forget about ourselves. And the bottom of the rice is just burnt. And we're like, Dad, you got to make this rice all over again? But usually that's not what happens. We just scrape out the good rice on top and then throw away the rice on the bottom. 
And we do that to ourselves all the time as women. We continuously just put ourselves on the back burner and let ourselves get burnt out and let all the juices dry up and just say it's okay, we'll just work with what's on the top today. So what I think that we should do is just really pay attention to our personal environment, how we set up our lives for ourselves, and just take note of how we feel in certain situations. When something happens, close your eyes and think, where do I feel this at? If you're having a conversation with somebody and you're uncomfortable, think, where do I, where do I feel this uncomfortableness at? Like, is it in my chest? Is it in my stomach? Just feel your body and learn how to feel where your issues are and learn how to, after you feel where your issues are, follow up, research, get help, and do the things that are necessary to get better. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, so much for sharing. Um, and when I tell you, it is truly important um, to have these discussions with our young ladies because as adults, we did not know. And we have battled with issues and, and trying to figure it all out at our age. So how much more impactful would it be? But then also, too, um, I'm just wanting to say that um, I'm just so excited that um, this series right here is truly important for me. It's called the Rooted Series. And it's the Rooted Series because, you know, it's understanding um, the root. You know, God is our root. And what he gives us is structure. He gives us support. We all are here to support you all. And, and, but, you know, again, we have to have individuals that support us as well. And then also to strength. And so that is what we get from the root, which is God. And so in that, I'm wanting to say, you know, in mental health and um, addiction, all of that could be very dark, you know, but it takes us, you know, it's knowing, I know who I'm called to, which is the meek. I am called to ones that are the trees. We are the trees. Okay, you you guys out there online, you guys are the trees. And so it's understanding that. And so now, in helping individuals that are in the dark, you know, come out to the light. Now, do all of you have your light sources? And so in that, I am wanting to say, let's light up. Let's be about change. Okay, Miss Lauren Dior, love, you are meek, okay? You are a tree. I need for you to understand that. Okay, you are a source, will be a source for many. Okay, yes, yes, yes. And so for all of you that know that you are a light source, I just want you guys to all Understand that, know that, receive it, and then be able to walk in it. Thank you guys so much. This was absolutely beautiful. I love you guys. Thank you. And I love all of you out there as well. Thank you.